Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox and welcome back to Collector Conversations. One of the most exciting developments in the modern watch scene is the arrival of new generations. This man right here reminds me of myself a long time ago. Paolo, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tim. Good to be here. Now, this is very cool. You've got a broad spread, everything from swatch to longa. But where did the fascination start? I think I know the watch, but I don't know the reason. So that's the Tag Heuer uh, Aqua Racer, which I probably got when I was um, in fourth or fifth grade. So I started watch collecting uh, probably because a lot of my friends had the Tag Heuer Aqua Racer and I wanted to be like them and I wanted to be uh, cool, which I was not when I was a kid. And so um, I got that in the Philippines, where my mother's from, um, where she grew up. And then we used to visit every summer. And I've always loved watches because it was popular in my, in my family. So my aunt uh, always had a, a Rolex Datejust, the two-tone, probably 28 or 32 millimeters, I suppose. Um, and I remember that fondly. And my uncles and cousins had Rolexes and Cartier. So the watch collecting gene, I suppose, was always in my blood. Um, and my grandparents and my dad's side had watches. And I've always just loved watches. I, I like to be on time. I'm almost never late. I'm pretty much always early. And so watches in that way are very important to me. I, I've, I've worn that watch um, on and off when I was in uh, grade school. And then I wore it all throughout college. And then until I was like, 24, 25 years old. So uh, it's been through a lot. It saw me through graduate school, through college, through lots of stuff. And I, I've dropped it a lot, actually. Um, so it doesn't work anymore. And the bezel actually doesn't work. But I've been wanting to bring it uh, to get to get redone, to uh, get serviced. I'm assuming this is a never sell watch. No, oh, yeah. No, well, it's not even worth anything. I've like looked it up. <laughs> it's probably like 200 bucks. Um, and it's broken. <laughs> and it's interesting because it is, it is a younger, uh, like a much younger person's size. That's what... Yeah you know, Rolex would have called a boy's size back in the 40s or 50s. Sure, yeah, it's a, it's definitely a boy's watch. And I remember my friend or classmate in grade school uh, had a, also the same watch, but it was bigger. It was probably 40 millimeters. And he would wear it underneath his his palm. And I was like, isn't it hitting the table all the time? And I'm, I'm pretty sure it was. And I don't know if that watch even works anymore. Well, this one doesn't work, but it yes. could again. It could, yes. Never sell. It's it's a watch-shaped object for now. Yes. Was there an occasion associated with it? A birthday, a holiday, uh, some sort of milestone that you remember? I think we were just on vacation in the Philippines. We used to go to the Philippines every summer, um, and then, you know, I would see fake Rolexes actually <laughs> in like shopping areas, and I would look at them and. I remember one had a open case pack, which I thought was remarkable at the time because they didn't have open case packs um, until recently, of course, the new Daytona. And so, uh, yeah, it was it was wild to see so many watches and um, not ADs, basically. So you wore this one through grad school into adulthood, but then you realize you got to catch up for lost time. You've got a lot of watches on the table. Walk me through some of the milestones that these embody because you have a story behind almost every one of these. Yeah, so I like... That's the, Let's start here. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's the Omega, um, the the Deville. Um, I got that in 2015 when I got my first job, my first adult job after graduate school. Um, I haven't dropped that one. Actually, I dropped it once. Uh, it hasn't been serviced, but it still keeps pretty good time. I use some watch timing app, and it's probably plus or minus four seconds a day. So it's still running okay. So one could say it takes a licking and keeps on ticking. Yeah. <laughs> Sure does, yeah. I'm hoping the copyright on that is expired, guys. Double check. <laughs> um, so I got that. I bought it online because um, I didn't know there were no ADs where I was living at the time in Virginia where I was working. And um, yeah, I wanted a, an Omega. I, I love the gold hands, the, the gold indices, the, the combination of the what I would call um, the nipple indices and the, <laughs> and, uh, the Roman numerals. So that I wore until probably 2019, and I wear it on and off, and it's seen many straps. When I first got it, I didn't actually know that you couldn't put leather straps or you couldn't submerge leather straps in water. And so I wore it in the darkroom all the time when I was printing. Um, and eventually, after like six or seven months, the, the strap just went away. Uh, well, I was just going to say, like, yeah. you're tough on your watches, I got to say. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> they actually look great externally. And I, I gotta wonder, given the Speedmasters and the Seamasters, I know my first major watch that I bought with graduation money was a Seamaster. Yeah. The DeVille is a little bit under the radar. Were you drawn to the DeVille line? I was, so I was able to try, my parents live in New York City, so I was able to try on uh, the, uh, the Speedmaster and it was just too big for my wrist. And I thought that anything above 40 millimeters would be uh, too large and I didn't like the lugs hanging off the edges. And so this one I thought, okay, it's 39 and a half, um, that's okay. And I went through a few watches actually. I bought an eBell because my mom had eBells or has eBells, um, also too big, so I returned it. And then uh, I landed on the Omega. Um, I like the, the sort of under the radar uh, nature of the watch and I like that it was a strap um, and I needed a date and it told the time and it was, that was good. <laughs> and, and this was your celebrate the first job watch. Celebrate the first job watch, yeah. Now it's fascinating to me that you do seem to mark milestones with watches and the scope of what you got, it really varies as we see everything from Swatch to Langa on the table. Yeah. And I would say Cartier probably lands somewhere in between. Were you on a classical kick when you bought this one? <laughs> what was the occasion and what was the idea? Well, I made a, a big jump in jobs in 2019, and so I thought, okay, I'm gonna buy another watch now. Um, and, you know, I've always loved Cartier. Um, my, uh, some people in my family wore Cartier watches and had some of the jewelry, so I was always drawn to that. Um, but I was particularly drawn to this watch because it was the first Pilots watch. And so uh, I loved that nature of it. And I had tried on um, a Royal Oak years before and I wasn't into it because it was also too big. So I like that nature to it. I like that it was stainless steel. Um, I liked that it was time only, no date. So that to me fit in with the aesthetic I was leading uh, or having and f so no date and uh, just time only worked for me. And all the watches that I have and that I want to have must have a second hand. Um, so I can't deal with a watch, for example, that only has minutes and hours uh, because I need to know, I need to be precise with my timing, particularly as a printer in the dark room and as a photographer. Communities were tough to come by when I was a, a younger person sure. trying to get into the watch space. What kind of resources did you leverage in the early days to learn about watches and meet other people with, who were like minded? Well, of course, I would watch Tim Moss's videos online. <laughs> uh, read Hodinky. Um, I got a couple issues of Revolution, Revolution Magazine, but I've never gone to a watch meetup. Um, I go to the authorized dealers, I go to stores and look at watches. Remember when I was a kid, actually, in New York City, I would go to the Turno on 57th Street and just look at watches. And the I'm, time machine? The time machine, right. Now it's a career, I guess. Yeah, I, I went to the time machine too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I love that store um, and it's totally changed. It's it's now too nice for me, so I can't go in there anymore. They have a coffee shop and um, I just wanted to like look at the watches. But I remember going in and on the right side there was Rolex and I would always look at the Rolex watches because I thought I would want one. Um, but it turns out you can't get one, so I stopped trying. And so uh, that, that was how I would learn and look at watches. Um, and I remember I didn't know what a chronograph was since I'd never understood why there'd be subdials on a watch. And I, now it's funny because we all we all grow that way. It's like, what on earth is Sidere real time? <laughs> what does a minute repeater do? Yeah. We don't, like we all come like to an epiphany at some point, like, oh, that's what it does, or that's why it does. Yeah. And you eventually did sort of, I guess, come to that epiphany because we've got a chronograph here and it was a milestone watch for you. Yes. Yeah, so um I tried on the 15202 years ago, probably 2017, 2018, and I I didn't like it. Um, again, no second hand. I tried on the 15450. I liked that 37 millimeters, um, but I was turned off by the price. And then you know the pandemic happened. I was working from home. I, I love Zoom. I miss Zoom very much. And I. Um, but I was about to move in with my then girlfriend, now fiance, and I thought, you know, I'm gonna try to buy this watch. I, I really liked um, the Royal Oak Chronograph that came out in 1998, the 39 millimeter version. But what I didn't like was the dial. So I didn't love the differences in color. I didn't love um, the red hands, for example. I, I'm a more uh, subdued person, I suppose. I try to be, at least. 
And so when I saw The Great Dial come out in 2018 or 19, I was like, that's a watch that I would want. Um, and then I, you know, I never convinced myself to get it until later on. And so um, if I may, uh, you know, you have the, the lighter uh, minute track, you have the, the gray Grand Tapisserie, and then you have the different tonality for the subdials. And yeah, I, I related it to my photography because it's monotone, different gradients of gray. And to me, a great print is a tonally rich print. It's a muscular print. And so I hope that, to me, this watch suggests or brings those values back to me as a photographer. There are a few watches on the table that could be described as either grayscale or if not monochromatic, very close. The Cartier, the Longines, the Audemars Piguet, the Moon Swatch, you've yeah. got the, the Saxonia. And I, I guess my question is, is this deliberate? Do you have like a, a rule for buying watches? Must it be a certain way or does it strike your heart and then you rationalize it you know, intellectually? <laughs> well, I think it's the second one. I, I look at a watch and I'm like, can I wear this? Does this fit within my way of being? Um, I, I love looking at watches. I love shopping for watches. I like to try them on if I can. Um, but I can't wear like a red faced watch. Uh, I just saw the Atelier when uh, the red faced, I forget that what it's called from Revolution Watch, and thought that's a beautiful watch. But the red's too loud for me. I can't be sticking out. Um, no, no, I, yeah. I understand. <laughs> uh, but you know, little. Little splashes of color here Little splashes of color, yeah. You've got the DeVille with the splashes of rose gold, but right. also the blue strap. Yeah. You've got an unexpected moon swatch, Mission to Jupiter. How did this come about? Honestly, I wanted the Mission to Neptune, the blue one, <laughs> but I couldn't find it. At the time when I bought this, um, I went to three swatch stores, I think. One out here in Pennsylvania, a couple in New York, and they all told me that the um, mission to uh, to Neptune was no longer being produced. I was like, are you sure? So I looked it up, and apparently it was true. And this one they had in the store, and I bought that one. Um, and I looked it up. I'm like, oh, this is this works pretty well for me. It's, it's brown. It matches my skin. Um, the orange hands. You've got you've got little accents of color here. You got yeah. little accents of color here. Little accents of color here. You've got the pop of the cabochon on the Cartier. Yeah. And then the, the GMT that I have today also has the, the pop of blue as well. The, oh, it's, it's not really quite there, but you can see the, the blue. Oh, of course. Yeah. Now, is this consistent with your preferences as a photographer? Are you mostly a black and white photographer? I am definitely, a, well, these days I am a black and white photographer. So the pop of blue works for me because I like blue. I like gray, blue, and black, basically. And so... All those colors fit within my my sphere of, of um, my interest as a person. And so, you know, as I think about it more to your previous question, Tim, it certainly is deliberate that these are monotone or that they have a similar color. It's it's definitely um, something I think about later, not before I buy it, but it, it's, it's probably subconscious before I buy a watch. Now, this is actually your second Grand Seiko. You had the white birch. I had the white birch. And so uh, beautiful movement, um, really great design. I love the dial, but it was time only, and I wasn't really thinking that deeply. Um, but then, you know, I've always wanted a GMT. I have, I have a couple of chronographs. I have a time only. I have the date. I have a sub-dial with the longa. I have, the, I have a pocket watch now. So I, like, I need a GMT and uh, to help me complete the collection and then eventually an annual calendar, of course. But, uh, you know, I tried to get the Rolex for a long time and I tried it on a few times and the, the Batman, the black and the blue was a little bit too loud for me. I just, I, I don't like how recognizable it is and also it was terribly hard to get at a retailer. So now this was a relationship milestone watch right here. Yeah. But then so was this. And what's the story? Because this may not, this isn't actually your watch. That's not it? my watch, no. That's uh that's for my fiance. And I gave that to her in March of uh 2022, I believe, yes. And so we're getting married soon. Um and so I got that for her. I wanted to get her a watch and I knew that she wouldn't like anything too big. Um, and that just, I saw that on the Hodinkee side and I thought, oh, that's, that looks good. And 
I looked at the other Longines, but I didn't like that it had uh, the numbers on it. And uh, John Goldberg gave that one the okay online, so I was like, okay, I can get this. <laughs> okay, it's like, it's like, you know, the Pope is Bluster, right? Yes. <laughs> So this is the Longines Heritage Classic. It's the Hodinkee Limited Edition. Came out, I want to say, 2019. A sector dial, a very clean look, uh, but very distinctly vintage. Um, I, I suppose yeah. this is the way to have your cake and eat it, too. It looks vintage, but you don't have the delicacy issues. And also, I guess I have to ask, who wears this watch more, you or her? She does. Okay, <laughs> just check. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely for her, but she lent it to me for today. <laughs> Fair enough. Now, you do have a vintage watch here that's a true vintage watch, and it's yeah. the only pocket watch on the table. There must be a tail there. Yes, yes. So, the Elgin, um, for my birthday back in December, we went to the National Watch and Clock Museum uh, out of Lancaster, uh, Pennsylvania. And so, I love diners, so we went to a diner uh, probably 20 minutes away, and then there was a little uh, vintage shop, like a like a whatever, like you could buy knickknacks there basically, and they sold um, dust clocks, they had some pocket watches, and I just saw all these pocket watches at the museum, I was like, I gotta have a pocket watch. So I, I saw a bunch of really big ones, um, this was the smallest one they had, and, and I got it. It was made in 1912, 12 is my favorite number, it's also my birthday number, um, and I thought this was great. So I never carry this around because it doesn't actually, the chain doesn't fit any, it's like it's too small. <laughs> you gotta have a jacket made just for the watch. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta say that movement is spotless. Yeah. Like that, normally I would say it's bad when a watch goes 100 years without a service, but I sure. think that might be what's going on here. <laughs> Look at the solarization on those wheels. Can you see that spiral? I love that, yeah. Oh my gosh, you guys gotta get this. This, yeah. this is, the best display case back on the table, and that's <laughs> that's even considering you bought a Longa. But tell me about this, because this is reaching the apex of horology. Yes, so the Longa, I was on a real kick after I bought the Audemars Piguet, um, and like I gotta have a Longa. So, you know, I looked at the the Longa one, which was beautiful, uh, the, the, the dial, um, the date, but it was manual wind, and I like automatic watches if I can, but I still wind the watches every day, or when I'm wearing them at least. Um, but I, one of the reasons I was attracted to the longer one was the date and the date pusher. So actually, I set this up today, this morning, so it said 27, so I could push the date on camera if that's okay. Oh, go for it. So I'll push it to 28, and then it just transfers to 28. And I really love that pusher adjustment. Um, and yeah, it's really, really incredible to me. And so, you know, same thing, black dial, black date discs. Um, it reminded me, of course, of the 1994 version of the Saxonia, um, the Darth, uh, that came out when uh, Longo was reinvigorated, I suppose. And so I like that history to it. Um, and I love the, the, the case back, the, the rotor. I love looking at it under a loop. Um, but, you know, I was really contending with this watch for a while because I actually originally wanted a Saxon map because I wanted a micro rotor okay. and I wanted the small rotor, but uh, it only had white date discs. You couldn't get by the black one. So I went for this, but I love this anyway. Little things like that though. To an aesthete, the black on black is super important and I could see how that would eat you up if it weren't perfect. Oh yeah, yeah. I get eaten up by a lot of things and so that would, that would really piss me off. <laughs> Do you have any goal watches? Is there anything else uh, on the roadmap, so to speak, or just something that's nagging at your heart? The 5396G, the Patek, uh, the annual calendar. I saw it uh, in 2021 at Govberg Jewelers and I didn't buy it but it was beautiful. That one I love. Um, so annual calendar is next on my list, hopefully. Um, I, w I would have loved to have the 1815 chronograph, um, but that's a little out of my budget. <laughs> so, no, I totally understand. Yeah. <laughs> now in the meantime, you got an impressive career in photography and the traditional equipment to carry that on. A lot of folks who were involved in photography are satisfied with digital, but you are a real photographer. Tell me about how you incorporate the darkroom timer. So I'm I'm an analog photographer, meaning I develop film, I print in the lab. Sometimes I scan if I'm having a show, for example. But I also use this in the darkroom, um, and I try not to look at my watches when I'm printing. But this is my darkroom timer that I've had um, maybe 20 years now. And 
you know, you just turn this maybe for one minute and then I can develop my film or I can wait a minute when I'm, when I have a print in the stop bath, for example. Um, this has loom, amazingly, for the, the orange safe light in the dark room. And I use this to time film development and printing. So time is very important for photography and in my life as a watch collector and in my life um, as an artist. And so even if you're off by, let's say, 15 seconds when you're developing film, that can totally shift the way the negative looks. And so this timer is my best friend in the dark room. And then it will, it will just stop. There you go. Is, do you have an Instagram account? Is there a place people can see your work online? Uh, my watch collecting is called Babu's Watches, um, which is my, uh, what my fiance calls me. Um, so that, that's where I share my watches. Very cool. Hello, thank you so much. Thank you, Tim.